Hey there folks, Dave Politis, KNM Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And I'm here with you in the library. These are all the uh, reference materials for the books I've written and all the, uh, all the data that I collected over the years. And I have bookcases and bookcases of this stuff that go on forever. A uh, couple of things right, right from the beginning. Do not <laughs> buy missing 411 books other than at our store. You'll get ripped off. Amazon, all these other places are charging three or four times, 75 to 100 bucks for a book. We charge $24.99. So just want to tell you so you don't get ripped. Uh, I've got three really compelling stories for you today, and they all have a hook to them. And they all have great similarities that I... I think you're going to get right away. But first, let's get to the important part, the letters. And the first story, I call it the dog story. Hey Dave, there's something that keeps nagging at me to write to you. A short time ago, I watched you in a segment where you talked about your dog that died of cancer when you are in college. You had said you came home from college to see your dog you had had for a number of years. I could tell by you telling a story that the dog meant a lot to me. Dog meant a ton to me. I could see your pain of losing her, your friend, your family member. I could see that you still had a soft spot in your heart for the dog. <laughs> I can remember growing up where that dog would team around with me and go places and do things. And you know, you can always trust your dog and your dog is always going to be loyal. And I knew that, and it meant a lot. Growing up, I always had a love for dogs. I'm 71 now and still have dogs, three of them with me right now. I want to share with you about a dog I had a few years ago. His name was Lobo, a shepherd husky. We got him at a pound when he was a year old. So a few years ago, he was going on 14 and was getting very ill. Even when he slept, he had bowel movements, a hard time walking, etc. One night, as he lay in the living room and I was preparing supper, he looked up at me and tried to get up with no success. I then said to my, my husband, I think it's time for him to go home, meaning to put him to sleep. We did not want him to suffer anymore. And you know, that, that's the part about being a human to a dog deciding that we have to put him to sleep, put him out of his misery. It's horrible. It's horrible. As I write this, it brings tears to my eyes. Lobo finally got up on his feet and wanted to go outside to potty, and he and our other dog, Mally, went outside to do their business. A short time later, they wanted in and as I let them in, Lobo had his mouth w filled with a stuffed duck that was his favorite toy. He came in and put it at my feet. I threw it and he managed to go get it and bring it back, but that was it. He lay down again. One thing about Lobo's favorite duck was it had laid outside in the yard for almost a year and he never touched it. almost threw it away because he didn't play anymore with it and it was old and he was ill. But that night when we decided to let Lobo go home, he went out, got his duck, brought it into us. Now did he know he was going home to our loving God? I tend to think so. So if a dog knows he is going home to our father, how much more our Father in Heaven loves us and brings us home to Him. As I know your son is home now, and when you pass on, your son will be there with open arms, waiting for you. A side note, a side note here these days, later I had a thought in my mind, mind's eye, so to speak, I seen Lobo in this beautiful field of flowers. 
standing there looking at me. And I felt him let me know he was so happy. He was with our Lord. He then turned around and ran back into the field. For me, I know our souls, animal souls, all go back to heaven. Where they all came from in the first place. I know this is long, but I felt so impressed to you to write. Love your shows. One more thing I heard that our loved ones are close by and are pained therewith when we are so sad. Ben loves you as does our Lord. You will see him again. hear that a lot. I hope everyone's right. I hope we do. I hope I see my dog again. You know, many times when I'm out and walking around, pretty stoic pretty much get my game together and things don't bother me those kind of letter letters hit my soul because as somebody said in weeks prior if you spell dog backwards it's God it's pretty prophetic and others have said you know they, they're probably angels that have come here to help take care of us, look over us. One thing I cannot stand is people that abuse animals. I don't understand it. It bugs me really bad. And when I was in law enforcement, I had no pity for anyone who did that. And even today, animals are so helpless in our presence. They need, our, they need our assistance, especially domesticated animals. Okay, sorry about that. Thoughts from the UK. Hi Dave, I've emailed you before and was fortunate enough to be, to be heard. I'm writing this in response to one of your recent interviews, videos where you talk about people just not getting it. Well, the way I look at this, we humans on Earth, etc., are not just a tiny speck in this vast universe. The possibility for other things existing to be that big man, Bigfoot, aliens, portals, whatever it is, almost a certainty. My thinking is this. It's pretty much a given aliens exist. There much, there's much more evidence out there for some form of life on other planets. Now, it stands to reason that there are aliens. There has to be more than one species of them. There just has to be. It again stands to reason that if there are multiple species of alien, and in turn they have the technology for space travel, the technology for other things must exist too, such as cloaking, advanced propulsion, even time travel or portals. It yet again stands to reason that if any of this exists, our government would want to have it. We're better to try such technology than places like Skinwalker Ranch, or perhaps national parks where it could be perhaps tried out in portals and on local wildlife. Could it be that sometimes wandering humans get accidentally caught up in these experiments or practices, hence the missing 411? I'm a firm believer in where there's smoke, there's fire. If native tribes all over the world throughout history claim to have contact with other beings, be that skinwalkers, Bigfoot, little people, even angels and God, then, well, there must be some truth to that. What an ancient human might think a God could well have been an alien visiting from another planet in time. Just because someone nowadays doesn't believe it possible doesn't mean it couldn't or didn't happen. I firmly believe that most people nowadays are quite frankly stupid, dumbed down by TV and mainstream media, consumed by reality TV and such. Just look at the COVID situation and see how pitiful and narrow-minded people have become. They believe that the TV or celebrities tell them to. Critical thinking is non-existent in most people nowadays and it's actually quite dangerous. 
I'm not a physicist or a scientist. I don't understand space and time or anything like that, but I believe the possibility for portals and parallel universes to exist, or at least the possibility for it to exist. I believe there are multiple species of Bigfoot type creatures ranging from prehistoric caveman types to almost full on apes. I bet people who laugh at this don't realize that the panda was considered a joke up until about 50 years ago. <laughs> I've recently discovered the possibility of other things as well. Could these things be some type of government experiment gone wrong? Quite possibly, as I know for a fact, the US and German Nazi governments were conducting experiments on animals, particularly dogs, since the 30s, trying to enhance them for military purposes. Yeah, our great Dr. Fauci was doing experiments on dogs, too. Look it up. Could there have been some kind of relic canine? Possibly. Again, different people throughout history claim to have had contact with dog, men, and werewolves. Could they still exist in the world? Absolutely. There's been a number of fatal attacks on people and animals that just couldn't be any normal dogs, as were claimed. There's an area in, uh, again, if there are multiple species of alien, it stands to reason they would have different personalities and different interests. Some would be friendly and some may not. Some would be interested in studying us. They would be interested in hunting us. Some might even want us as pets. What are their words, worlds like? Could we ever go there? Possibilities like this must be taken into account when discussing anything like this. It's a snowball effect. If one thing is so, then other things must fall in and from and so on. One thing is for certain, that a narrow mind is a sure sign of a fool. That's a good one. Read that again. One thing is for certain, though, a narrow mind is a sure sign of a fool. Keep this up. Keep up the fantastic work. If you ever come to the UK, look me up. We'll have a beer or two. Thank you. It'll be fun. I don't drink a lot of hard alcohol. I rarely, rarely do. But I drink beer. I don't drink every night. I think maybe I have one beer a week. It's usually my norm. If it's summer and I'm somewhere else, maybe two beers a week. But as I've told you before, alcohol never solved any problems and alcohol never led to anything good my own personal opinion. So if you had, don't drink, don't start. Hi Dave, I'm your neighbor and village member just across the border in Idaho. Love Idaho, love my neighbors in Idaho. My background, been to college just long enough to permanently ruin my chances of ever making a really good redneck. I'm sending a few short notes to cover a few things that have been on my mind. Well, as you people know, I released a book, Missing 411 Idaho, about that state. Maybe that's why this person's writing. A few disconcerting thoughts on chronic wasting disease. I'm hoping someone in our village can answer this. CWD is a prion disease caused by a protein. So I've been told that it's the size of a protein is much smaller than that of an amoeba or a bacteria. A prion can live in the soil for many years, possibly forever. My thoughts are that it will inevitably make its way into our streams and rivers. So will a backpack water filter designed to filter out Giardia and Beaver fever filter out something as small as CWD? If the answer is no, it's a pretty scary thought. Think about that. Well, first of all, our great scientists have said that CWD won't cross over to the human barrier. But guess what? They also tell you not to eat the meat if it's contaminated. Now, why would they do that? Our fishing game is studying the disease. They say there's no record of the, of the disease being transmitted to humans, but if your harvested game tests positive, don't eat the meat. Ka-ching! Sounds like a double-sided message to me. So in my memory, many years ago, there was a news report, I believe came out of Minnesota, that said two people had died of CWD. The report said that experts thought they must have gotten some of the central nerve tissue from their harvested wild game into the consumable meat. This report came out before the explosion of the computer age, so verifying the source of this may be hard or impossible. I don't remember if this was a newspaper article or a TV report. I'm just dead certain about hearing and reading this while hoping CWD would never come to Idaho. 
I'm hoping, Dave, that with your research expertise, you can check out the validity of the statement. Or maybe someone in the village knows something about it. So our fishing game is in a hard spot. Most of their revenue comes from the sales of big game tags. If they say there is no danger to humans, though consuming the meat, they are liable for loss, lawsuits and defamation. If they say they are in danger to humans, they simply financially slit, slit their throats. And there is the conundrum. It's obviously not good to eat contaminated meat. Everybody says it. And the real problem is that none of the states have a plan that's viable to get rid of CWD. And it keeps moving. I guarantee for a fact it's in Idaho, even if it hasn't been tested positive in the game there. I guarantee it's in Idaho. So here's a question of his. Just a question. When you call search and rescue, who pays for it? Good question. 99.99% .99 of the time, it's absorbed by the government and the volunteer agencies that commit to finding the person. Now, if you go into an area that, say, is closed, and the Forest Service does close areas, and you go into that area and are lost, you're in trouble. You may end up paying for that search and rescue because they told you not to go there and you're violating the law. So if you're violating the law, you may be on the hook. So don't violate the law. Number three, Dave, this story is special for you. I'm a Christian and as a human, I grew up questioning my faith. You know, hoping that heaven is real. My faith has been confirmed and I personally want to relate to you a story as it has meant much to me. My oldest son, Zach, who has just turned 22, and as I am an older father and sneaking up on 70 in a couple years, so I had many years of contemplating heaven and hell. When my son was about 14 months old, an interesting experience occurred. I went to visit my mother in a neighboring town. My father, my son's grandfather, passed away five or so years before this experience. We were at my mom's with my son playing with blocks on the floor when my mom, my wife, and myself were conversing. Suddenly, my little son, Zach, stands up and starts sucking on his binky really fast. His eyes get big and he runs over and excitedly points at a picture of my dad on top of my mom's TV. He points to the picture and then points at my mom and keeps pointing back and forth in an intense manner. My mom explains to him that that was grandpa. He simply knew who my dad was. The only place Zach could have known his grandfather was in the spirit world before he was born. It is my belief that my dad picked out my son for us. I'm 100% certain. But God seems to know what I usually need kicked in the butt twice before any knowledge makes it all to my head. So a week or so later, I was home with my son, who was again playing on the floor with his toys. I'm looking through our family history book, which my mom had written. I was looking at a picture of my dad's family of nine kids consisting of three women and six men. Again, Zach started sucking on his binky really fast. His eyes got big and he runs over and sticks his finger right on his grandfather in the family picture. What is incredible is that the six brothers in the picture look exceptionally alike, and Zach knew exactly which one was my grandfather, was his grandfather. No doubt in my mind that Zach's grandfather picked his little spirit out for us. So the bottom line is, we come from people in the spirit world that love us, and when we die, we go back to them. Dave, I just wish I could place this in your heart as solid as it is in mine. And that's good. I appreciate that. I have a small point here to make out about our village. And I've almost 50, 69 years on this planet. I've had maybe a total of three hours of unexplained experiences. Rather than relate them in detail, I'll categorize them to keep this short. I have already, along with lengthy condolences for you concerning Ben, sent you a story about my issues with footsteps in the woods. A story I would never believe if someone had told it to me, but the problem is that I was there. I have to believe it. I have seen something in the sky that midsummer afternoon was bright like Venus in the evening sky, but was like a donut 
that you could see through the center. Only once have I developed a bad feeling in the woods that made me about face and take a different route. I had an experience of driving through Lapway, L-A-P-W-A-I, Lapway, Idaho, from north to south and then consecutive driving through Lapway again, north to south. Thought maybe I was nuts, but then about 10 days later, at the same time of day, dusk, I did the exact same thing again. The problem was that this time I was aware and was making sure it didn't happen again, but it did. The only time I've ever experienced extreme fear and dread was with an entity in a house my buddy lived in. My buddy had many experiences of this entity. He never mentioned it to me until I related my experience to him. In total, I had three experiences with it, two of them with my buddy present. So to make a lot so to make a lot of long story short, sometimes this reality we view as being so solid just simply gets a rip in it. And God only knows what really happens when that occurs. My point is this, if a person has never had any unexplainable experiences in their life, it would be easy to be a skeptic of your work in our village. Actually, it would be exceptionally easy. So Dave, don't let the skeptics irritate you or get you down. They simply just don't know. Keep up the good work. You're doing an abundance of good things for people in our village. I'm sure it's not an easy task. I just went through a year and a half of serious cancer ordeal and hopefully have beaten it. I want you to know how much watching your videos really did help me survive this ordeal. Thanks, Dave. Well, thank you for that well put together letter. Which reminds me of something I've meant to say a long time ago. If you send me an email or you post a note on the video, sometimes I get these emails and they're a page long, no paragraphs, and it's just sentences after sentences. And I look at that and I just put it aside. It's too hard to read, it's too hard to comprehend. In the past, I've gone through, I've read down the punctuation and the paragraphs just so I could read it to you. But I'm, I've been too inundated now with emails to, to read those. So what I'm asking is to take a little bit of time and put it in readable form so that I can read it. And, it. and it makes it easier on me. I'd really appreciate it. And I want to read everybody's and that, that, would, that would help. Hey Dave, I've closely followed your Coast to Coast programs and now regularly tune in to posts on YouTube. You are really careful about what you say in your posts and I appreciate your discretion. I try to be very careful what I put in posts. I also listen to a wide range of content makers, authors, etc. on other platforms. Not beholden to normal media outlets. I think it's a multifaceted phenomenon and has all of the above options and most probably more. Number one, ET races use us as a food source directly or by more subtle means, abduct, hunt, never to return. Two, we are allied races, conscript military forces from planet to fill the fighting ranks, science geeks, other useful humans to wage the war in the solar system galaxy, also likely never to return. Three, interspecies breeding to improve, charge theirs, ours for survival and evolutionary purposes. Simple slave labor, trafficking, or off the planet. Five, the worst, adrenochrome cult, and it's them and human elites, darker, darker, darkest. Six, Bigfoot, we see unattended kids and take them, hairy daycare workers. Since there are several types, cultures of these, equals our natural forest dwellers may be more benign. Me, big concern is an unsettling idea that a German Nazi breakaway group might indeed have colonized Antarctica, moon, dark side. And that is why German ancestry in your cases might be significant. My cousin went to Germany many years ago as a college student and was asked by a German lady, why are you coming here, dear? Eek. Something I was reminded of last week. Thanks for that letter talking about Bigfoot sites. I know I'm not talking about Steve. There's a couple of really big Bigfoot sites. And I've had friends that worked at a couple of those sites. 
The reason I tell you not to listen to them, not to follow them, even though some of you are just absolutely committed to them, is they lie. The stories are fabricated and they lie. And that's why these friends of mine left that show. And they told me the reason they left is that it's they lost their credibility, they lie, they twist, they make the stories fit what they want it to fit. That's bothersome. That means you're taking you're being taken advantage of. Next letter. Hey Dave, I find the letters you read fascinating. I listened to them three times. I actually saw something supernatural back in June 2014 under sunny skies at about 5.30 p.m. Thank goodness my neighbor was a witness to it too. I'd been inside studying and run outside to take a break. I happened to catch a movement in the sky and thought it was an airplane, but quickly discovered it was a round floating metallic looking ball, about six feet in diameter, 100 feet above the tree line, slowly moving in the sky without making any noise. My neighbor quickly ran into his house and fetched two pair of binoculars and handed me one. It wasn't until I fixed the binoculars onto the object that I noticed it looked drastically different. To the naked eye, it was a metallic floating ball, but with the binoculars, it was an irregularly shaped black object with glowing orange-yellow orbit at center. Like the color of fire, it was shaking violently, violently like it was moving at an extremely fast pace, but it wasn't. Actually, later I wondered if it had been moving through dimensions. I kept as still as possible and I wouldn't lose it, and after a few seconds looked again and with the naked eye only to see a metallic ball. But again, through the binoculars, it looked like a orange-yellow orb surrounded by blackness. It only appeared in the sky for approximately two to three minutes. I don't tell the story often because people demand a picture. Let me just say this. When you witness something really odd like that, you're not thinking, let me run in and grab my iPhone or camera and get a picture for those who will surely doubt my story. No, you're thinking. I can't believe what I'm seeing. What am I seeing? What can I compare it to? I didn't dare take off my eye, take it, my eyes off it for fear it might disappear. Anyway, the next day a UFO story appeared online, but of course it was debunked by some type of flare, which I knew was not true. What I saw actually reminded me of a story from 2 Kings 6 of the Bible, which tells a story of a man named Elisha, who had fled from the king of Syria's army and thought it was lost until his eyes were opened and he saw the Syrian army surrounded by chariots of fire. It's not always easy to explain the supernatural, but I really enjoy the story. Myself and countless, countless others are so ever grateful for your diligence and dedication to help others. Thank you. P.S. I have a family member that went missing under unusual circumstances in Mississippi several years ago. He's never been found. Your work is so important. Thank you. If you're watching this, send me an email about that missing person in Mississippi if it fits our missing 411 profile. Again, the email's missing411 at yahoo.com. Next letter. I've been reading your books and listening to your interviews for upwards of 10 years now, and I want to thank you for your hard work and dedication. I come to you with a story from the summer of 2013. My father and I have gone camping in Jemez, J-E-M-E-Z, New Mexico for many years. But that summer will stand out to be one of the craziest experiences I've ever had. Not far from the campsites at Jemez Falls, there is a national preserve known as Valles, V-A-L-L-E-S, Caldera. It is a huge dormant volcano which has something to do year-round from fishing, hunting, hiking, and cross-country skiing. It's really a sight to see with a highly, and I would highly suggest a visit. The camping trip we wanted to do something different, so we took a short drive to the preserve to do it. When you get there, there is only one road that turns into the preserve and will lead you to a ranger station that's smack in the middle of the caldera. At the ranger station, you park your car, pay, and pick a hike you'd like to do from the map they have in the station. I remember asking one of the rangers which hike was the hardest, not necessarily the most scenic. The ranger told us that they had just reopened a trail, again after it being closed for many years. The trail was the Redondito Trail. Once the hike is selected, one of the rangers will drive you out to the trail and then you'll be picked up once you're done. 
with the hike. The hike itself is about five to six hours long, so either the ranger will already be there for you, or you'll have to wait for the pickup. There was another hiking party who needed to ride out as well, but for a different trail. Their hike was the same distance and ended where ours did. So the ranger said we'd also have to wait for the other family to finish theirs if we finished early. We were okay with that. The trail was more of a logging road than a normal trail, but we could immediately tell that the road hadn't been hiked on in quite some time due to the amount of fresh game tracks. A few hours in, we had, we had even come across a mule deer protecting her fawn right off the road. I didn't even notice them until I turned around to see how far back my father was. Immediately off the road to the right, there was a mule deer in attack position with her fawn between her legs. My father didn't see the deer as I didn't, as I didn't. So I just shouted out to my dad to pick up the pace and waved with my hand to have him hurry up. Once he got up with me, I had him turn around and see why I was urging him to move up the road faster than, the, and he saw the mule, mule deer in that position. We were maybe 30 meter, meters from the deer at this time, but as we were walking by it, it, it was five to 10 meters from us. Now I bring up the deer just to highlight that this trail really hasn't been used by humans in a while. At this position of the hike, you can see in both directions through trees fairly easily and pretty far in the bush. But once we made it to the crest where the hike started to level out, you couldn't see one yard into the bush off to the left of the road or to the right. You could see pretty far into the trees and there was, there was a being and there being a small clearing. In this clearing, there was also seemed to be some sort of watering hole or just a giant puddle where water had gathered over spring showers. When the hike starts to level out at the crest, we probably are halfway through that. The portion of the hike where it leveled out was pretty steep. Subsequently, my father had dragged behind about 50 to 100 meters. I'll stop there. Don't walk ahead of other people on a trail. Stay together. Walk at your dad's pace. Don't be last in line. So I stopped and decided to wait. I turned around looking at him, trying to catch my breath and with my hands on my hips, with thick brush now to my right. This is when I was able to assess my surroundings and just take in the beauty of the forest. When my father was maybe 10 meters from me, we heard this loud thud, which came from the thick brush to my right, maybe three yards in. That's how close it sounded. Now when I mean loud, it sounded like a giant boulder falling from the sky and hitting the ground. Immediately, we both looked in the direction of the thud, obviously not being able to see anything because of how thick it was. I remember just standing there trying to process what it was. I was thinking it was maybe a tree, but I didn't hear any subsequent branches breaking. It was just a thud. Within 30 seconds of hearing it, my dad got to me. We started to discuss what we just heard when our conversation was interrupted with two very distinct whoop whoops. We were both stunned. You hear and re read about these sorts of experiences that people have in the woods, but you don't think it'll ever happen to you. We were stunned locked after hearing those whoops, but that only lasted for a few seconds. When knocking rung out everywhere, all around us, like picking up a log and smacking it against a tree over and over again. It was not a woodpecker. These were legitimate knocks. The weird thing is I didn't feel afraid. It wasn't a fight or flight situation, but I knew that I got the feeling that we were not supposed to be there. We had initially wanted to stop after cresting to check out the giant puddle, but with the knocking all around us, we wanted to just hightail it out of there. I believe there were three or four different set of knocks. It was definitely surreal. Once the tra trail started to go down in elevation, the knocking completely stopped. We had gotten to the end of the trail and we were the only ones there. It wasn't long before Nate, the ranger pulled up in his van, maybe five minutes after we finished. The ranger got out and created some small talk when we waited for the other party to finish their hike. At some point during this talk, my dad asked the ranger if there had been any reports of Sasquatch in the caldera. The ranger stumbled over his words and was like, you want the truth? My dad and I looked at each other and were like, yeah, obviously. He said that earlier in the spring that same year, they rented out cabins in the caldera for a wedding reception. 
and supposedly there was a reported sighting at that event. He did also mention that the Finding Bigfoot crew had been out there for many years prior. The ranger followed up with wanting to know why we asked, so we proceeded to tell him what we had experienced. When we got to the knocking portion of the story, my father picked up two rocks to mimic the knocking that we had heard. While my father was knocking the rocks together, the knocking from the, knocking from the trail in the forest had begun to ring out again. It wasn't all around us this time. The knocks were definitely coming from the trail we just came down. My dad and I were both shocked it happened again, and we were frankly, frantically pointing to the trail saying, like that, like that, that's it. The ranger had sunglasses, so it was hard to read his expression, but his face was white like a ghost, and he wouldn't even acknowledge what we were just hearing, as if he was instructed to not just acknowledge that. He didn't say anything or respond to it. He just stood there with a blank face. Before we could even get a word out to him, the other hiking party showed up. We turned, immediately got in the van, and the, it was like nothing happened. I've been hiking in the Sierra Nevadas, Mount Hood, and the Rockies all my life, and I've never experienced anything like that wilderness. I honestly believe in Sasquatch, no matter how stereotypical the experience was. From the whoops and knocks, I'm now a firm believer because of it. I will always remember that time on the Redondito, R-E-D-O-N-D-I-T-O -O trail. Best regards. Quite a story, huh? I liked it. Do you have any fathom of an idea how many thousands of times this has happened to people? And they just don't talk about it. Don't want to hear it. The Rangers irritate the heck out of me. It's like a big secret that they can't talk about. Oh, no, 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 we can't talk about that. We can't admit it. I'll tell you that uh, I filmed in several parks over the years, national parks. I've met some super nice rangers, just really nice people. And one of them, we got away from everybody and we talked to them and he said, Dave, he goes, they don't want us bringing this topic up. Anything supernatural, paranormal, nothing. They want us to promote a fairy tale type existence in the woods here in the national park. And I have to be, this is him talking, and I have to be very careful what I say everywhere. I thought, wow. I think the national parks, if the rangers told the truth and said, yeah, there were supernatural things going on here or Bigfoot here, they'd have huge crowds there. <laughs> Their attendance would go, to, go up. People say, oh, well, maybe they're afraid about the attendance going down. No, I can guarantee that won't happen. I've known places in the U.S. where there have been Bigfoot sightings and all of a sudden the attendance at those locations goes way up. So, talk to you about these three missing person cases now. This first case, I've talked about it before. I've talked about it many times. And I call it the Lost Boys from Pickering, Ontario. Now, all these stories have an inter intertwined element. So I'm telling you this one again. So it happened on March 17, 1995, a cold, icy night. St. Patrick's Day night. Six high school friends went down to the marina in Pickering on Lake Ontario. Jay Boyle, 17, Chad Smith, 18, Robbie Rumbolt, 17, James Lafere, 17, Michael Cummins, 17, Danny Higgins, 16. Those six went down to two different marinas and broke in, forced their way in, burglarized it. Now, what I want to tell you about this is them breaking in isn't the story. It's unimportant to the story, but they did it. Uh, and they took a boat. They took an imitation Boston Whaler. Boston Whalers, they're essentially unsinkable because they're filled with foam in, the, in their hull. So they took one of these boats. 
they took the boat and they left. They were, they actually took that and a paddle wheeler and some other some other things, and they went out on the lake. And they disappeared. Yeah. Pretty strange. Six young men, healthy, happy, athletic, gone. Where'd they go? Well, you think in the months afterwards, their bodies would flow up on the beaches. They didn't. And when you think it's been 27 years and a body's never come up. Now, do bodies come up? Oh, yes, they do. I'm going to tell you a quick story about that. So this incident happened in Pickering, Ontario. This is Lake Ontario, right here. This is Pickering. Wilson, New York is right here. Whitby, Ontario is right here. Keep Whitby in mind. So this area has had more disappearances than you would ever believe. Strange, strange disappearances. Now these boys, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police made a huge effort. C-130 aircraft flew a grid pattern all over that lake. Helicopters, boats, Search went on for a long time, officially and unofficially. The only thing that was ever found that could loosely be contributed to the boat was in Wilson, New York, a couple weeks after they disappeared, they found a gas can they thought was part of the imitation Boston Whaler boat. Possible? Maybe. But that's it. It was a good sized boat. Where'd it go? Where'd the boys go? All six of them, they believed, got hypothermia and drowned. Which is possible. Certainly is possible. But the bodies should have washed ashore. Guaranteed. Now, the Whitby story I was telling you about. So. Here's Pickering, and right next to Pickering is Whitby, Ontario. Wrote a story, and I, I didn't want to take up a lot of time with it, but I'll tell it to you. It's about a teacher, a high school teacher. Every morning got up, ran. He's a runner. It didn't matter the weather. It could be 20 below, and this guy ran. One day he disappears. Months later, months later, his body washes ashore just outside of Whitby in a block of ice. It's true. I wrote about it. Made big press. He was missing his shoes and other things. None of the story made sense. The point I'm even telling you this is that bodies wash ashore. <laughs> that gentleman's body did, and these boys should have, and they didn't. What happened? It's, the story is still making headlines 20 years later. And it kind of got coined the Lost Boys. Parents are still devastated. And I understand why. Now, that kind of sets the pace for what I'm going to tell you next. The next story is in Australia. It happened April 15th. 2007 and it involved a boat 32 feet long called the Cas 2. Now the Cas 2 seaworthy stud boat catamaran. This is what it looked like. This is a picture taken when they found it adrift off the coast of Townsville, Australia. If you notice a couple things, sail was torn and it was adrift. The engine was in idle. It was on. And here's, for, here's the story. The boat was recently purchased by a man named Derek Batten, who was a captain, 56 years old, had sailing experience. Took along his best friends, Peter and John Trunstead, 69 and 63. And they were going to make a trip of a lifetime 
because they were going to go to Perth. Now, this is a map of Australia. This incident happened in this area. So north of Brisbane on the east coast of Australia. Here's Perth way over here. Now I've told you before, the disappearances I have written about in Australia all are in this area. I have yet to find a, a cluster of disappearances on the western side of Australia. But this is where this incident happened. So let me walk you through it. Three men, trip of a lifetime, taking the boat back to Perth, where they all lived. And it was going to take them about two months. They bought the boat. They met with the owner. He gave them extensive training on it. In fact, the day they left, the, the owner was at the dock. And they left April 15th, and they took off. That night, at 6.45, they radioed that they were off of George Point. Now, they left from Airlie, Australia. So, this is the departure point. George Point is up here. And at 6.45, they had traveled during the day up to this point. And they were going to go up over the northern top of Australia to Perth. Now, Townsville is the location where the boat was eventually brought to. But a helicopter flying along the Great Barrier Reef found it adrift on the 16th Barrier Reef. They didn't see anybody on board. They thought it was suspicious. So they notified Australian Maritime. And their Coast Guard went out a couple days later, found the boat. And, the, and on the April 20th, they boarded. What they saw, what they found was very unusual. And the first man on the boat was interviewed and he said, I didn't know if somebody came, was going to come running out from below deck and try to kill me. Or He said that there was a half a cup of coffee on the table. There was a laptop opened on the table. The engine was idling. Uh, the sail was ripped. They had the fenders out on the side of the boat. That is... I've had a boat many times in my life. Fenders are the bumpers that you put on the side of the boat when you're going to dock or you're going to meet another boat. And a lot of people said, oh, that's not unusual. Yeah, that is unusual to run with fenders out. Sorry. There's a large amount of food that the men had stored for the two-month trip. They found three cases of beer. And they found a 44 caliber rifle with 100 rounds of ammunition. The original trip that these men were taking was postponed because of bad weather. So they had waited. And on the 15th, the men had taken a video of themselves. One of the Trunstead brothers was at the back of the boat fishing. The others were talking. Another was videoing. And then the video ended. The point being is that everyone felt that it was that first day, first day and a half, something happened. Because there was nobody on the boat. Nobody on the boat. There was no blood. There was no evidence of a struggle. There was nothing. So Australia did an inquest as to what might have happened to the CAS. And they determined there were a lot of scenarios that were played out. And a coroner said he thought <coughs> that the brother was fishing. They saw that on the video. And they thought that maybe the line got tangled in the engine. One of the brothers went over to get the line out. Another one fell in who couldn't swim. And one of the brothers couldn't swim. Another brother went in after him. Now you have three people in the water. The boat engaged after they got the line loose. And the boat left and they were stranded in the water and all died. Not many people bought that scenario. Another one that was 
bought by a few is that the boat was running at full speed and they hit a sandbar and they all fell off. Another scenario is that a wind gust hit one of the main sails, the boom swung across and knocked them all in. Again, no blood anywhere. Another scenario that was played out extensively <laughs> was the paranormal scenario. Now, if you haven't read my books, Australia is a lot like us on disappearances. It's scary how close it is. I've written about many, many disappearances on that East Coast. And I did a big tour, uh, uh, book tour there. And I did a series of videos about disappearances there that are on this channel and they're part of the 240, 250 videos that you can watch right here, right now. If you look just under the video screen, it says Can-Am Missing Project. If you click on that, it, it'll take you to a page with all of the videos. So what happened to the CAS-2? Derek Batten, Peter and John Trunstead, gone. Of course, the Australian police and Coast Guard went out and they searched for days and days. They never found the man. It's one of the great mysteries of Australia and missing people. And a lot of people don't want to talk about these and don't want me to talk about these because maritime accidents can be explained away by a lot of things. But three people on one boat disappearing one I can logically say can happen, two, maybe three. All right. But, so the next case involves a disappearance in Canada. And I got to say that the area where this disappearance occurred in is just huge with disappearances, period. The man's name was Walter Richard Brown, September 23rd, 1953. He was married, had a one-month-old daughter named Donna. He was a Naval War veteran. He was an expert in radio communications. And he lived on Vancouver Island. He was an excellent swimmer. And on September 23rd, there was a half-day holiday on the island. So he went fishing with some friends and he decided to get his own boat. So here's where this happened. This is the Straits of the Juan de Fuca. We talked about this before. Out here is Nia Bay. This is Olympic National Park right here in the US. Nia Bay has disappearances. All along here are disappearances of young boys. Young boy disappeared up here on Vancouver Island. Other people disappeared right here. This is the Saanich Inlet Arm. And he disappeared on the Finlayson Arm. He was trolling through this area fishing. Okay. This is Walter. Walter Richard Brown. So... He's fishing, he's trolling, friends see him during the day trolling. And then they're supposed to meet at about five o'clock. He didn't come back. His friends go out looking and at 7, 7 p.m. in calm water, they found his boat washed up along the shore in the area where he was fishing. Everyone and the articles at the time all stated that he drowned, had to have drowned. Well, his wife made a statement at the time, no way. That man could swim like a fish. He would live. Well, police said that all the indications were he drowned. Now in the boat, there was no fishing pole, but his hat he was wearing was sitting at the bottom of the boat. Kind of odd. So, 33 days later in Penticton, Mr. Brown was working for a company 
and a fellow worker recognized a f his photo in the paper and said, hey, this is you, isn't it? And he goes, that looks like me. Well, he had worked for this company for a couple weeks. So in the paper, it said what street he lived on. And somehow or another, he got a phone number for a neighbor and he called the neighbor. Neighbor contacted his house, called his house, talked to his wife, figured out who he was. Supposedly had amnesia. Went home the next day, called the police, said he was home. His wife was interviewed by the news. He was interviewed by the news. It's a fascinating story. He said that he was on the boat fishing that day, and that's the last memory he has. He doesn't remember anything after that. Now, on the right side of his forehead, his wife said he had a scar there that he had never had before. He said he had no idea how he even got the scar. Amnesia. Loss of memory. I don't think you would hear of many people these days being diagnosed with amnesia. It just, I've read thousands of articles in the last several years. I don't hear anything about that now. The one thing I do hear is about memory loss. And that's in relationship to UFO abductions. Now this happened on the water, supposedly. What happened to Walter Brown? He obviously wasn't trying to run from his wife or his family obligations because soon as the person in Penticton showed him the picture, it instigated a thought in his mind as to who he might be. And he wanted to figure out his past because he didn't, says he didn't remember. So he wasn't trying to avoid identification as some people may have thought. You're a straight up normal person. He had a really good job on the island and he got another good job in Penticton. So the intertwining piece to all of these stories, all these people disappeared on the water. Why is that important? Well, first of all, there's many other stories that I've written about that have happened on the water. And in fact, I've done videos where people disappeared on the water. But remember, under the water is a great place to hide. And USOs, USOs hide in the water. So is that what happened to these people? I don't know. The Lost Boys of Ontario, six kids missing on one boat never found, never any evidence, no clothes washed ashore, nothing. How can that be? And then the cows too. Three men disappear. They don't find anything of them, nothing. And then Walter Richard Brown shows up in another part of Canada, 33 days after he disappeared having a scar on his forehead with no memory of what happened. Puzzling. I do this because I really want the village to think hard about what I talked to you about. These are all factual stories. I'm not leaving things out. I'm not putting things in. They're baffling. And, and yet, there's that tangible linkage between all of them and many more. So if you like the videos, give me a thumbs up. Please put this on your social media. Let people know that this is happening. And if you see my work being duplicated on other people's sites, please make a comment on their video and send people back to here. Put our link to our 
website, our YouTube channel on their site to show people the truth about where this is coming from. It's it tiring, people making lots of money off of me. And the people not understanding that it was our work that did it. So thumbs up, make sure you're still subscribed. Don't buy the books online other than us. All of the links to our various sites will be right on, on the number one pinned comment. A pinned comment is the number one comment on a website or on a video site. So if you look at the comments under this video, ours will be the pinned comment. And it'll show you the links to our different locations. Watch our videos, documentaries, see our books. Thank you for being here. I'm humbled. I'm humbled every day that somebody wants to listen. Be safe. I'm going to leave here in a minute. And I've got to do some shopping. And I can guarantee I'm going to do something kind for somebody today. And I want you to do the same thing. Thanks for being here. Politis out.